Have you ever experienced in your life one of those what now moments? You've uh, perhaps just sorted out one mess that life has thrown your way, just got through that, that one trial, but then you're, you're faced with another one. Uh, another trial is galloping towards you at, at breakneck speed. And so you just think, oh, what now? What now? I'm sure, I'm sure you can uh, relate to, to that experience. And that's why I think all of us here this evening are able to put ourselves uh, in Jacob's shoes and perhaps understand a little bit of, of how he must be feeling. He's just dealt with the problem of Uncle Laban, or rather God has dealt with the problem of Uncle Laban for him. But now he's confronted by his brother, Esau. Esau's response to these messengers that, that Jacob sends is really is just one of those, oh, what now moments. Look at, look at the news these messengers bring back. Uh, verse 6, then the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he also is coming to meet you and 400 men are with him. 400 men. You don't go to say hello and give your brother a big warm embrace with an army of men at your back. Esau clearly has not forgotten what Jacob did. 20 years may have passed but Esau has not forgotten how Jacob tricked and cheated him. His response is immediate, emphatic, terrifying. So having just escaped Laban, again, Jacob is, is faced with this, what seems to him, very real possibility that he, his family, they are about to die. The challenges you and I face, our Esau's, are more likely to perhaps be things like serious illness or, or financial hardship or, or family turmoil or, or bereavement or fallouts, maybe trouble in church life. But they gallop towards us, don't they? Sometimes with the same breakneck speed that we get the impression of Esau riding towards Jacob here. And often to us, they're, they're no less daunting no less challenging, no less terrifying. So as we look this evening at, at Jacob facing this onrushing trial, I want us to consider uh, two lessons about how to face trials. We're going to look at, at those two lessons. But I also think one of the things that really comes out of, of this text is this strange mixture of faith and fear. Faith and fear about this one trial. And though it's a strange mixture, it actually is, is so typical of our response to the trials that we face. So maybe that's the most helpful thing for many of us tonight. We'll be looking at this kind of mixed response of Jacob, the faith and the fear as they exist side by side in the child of God. Because the truth is, we can only actually uh, deal with this, learn from it and grow out of it if we acknowledge that this is us. But most of the time, perhaps our response to our trials is not pure faith, but fear and faith mixed together in a strange way. So my title this evening is Responding to the Trials of Life. Responding to the trials of life. And I want us to begin by considering the response of trust. The response of trust. How easy do you find trusting God? How easy in your day-to-day -day life, in, in the hardships of life, how easy do you find it to trust God? I think if we're completely honest with ourselves, we will admit that, that sometimes, maybe even often, the gap between our head and our hearts is is a mile apart, that they're so far distant from, from each other. We, we know God's promise. We know God's power. But as a trial gallops towards us at, at that breakneck speed, it, it just takes up all of our vision. That's all that we see. 
and the anxiety and the fear take over. The panic perhaps gets hold of us. And before we know what we're doing, we've, we've taken matters into our own hands. We've tried to find our own way through and, and out of the trial. That's Jacob. He's a man whose head and heart are, are just miles apart. He is a man who struggles to trust God in the trials of life. He's a man who struggles to trust God in the trials of life. We've seen it before in him. We saw it even, even last Sunday. Remember how he, how he snuck away from, from Laban because he was afraid, because he was scared. And this is why I, I love his example in scripture. He's, he, he's reminiscent of, of Peter in the New Testament. Peter's another one of those characters that I love. Do you, do you remember Peter? Think about him. At, at one moment, he's, 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 he's doing the greatest acts of faith. He's, he's one of the first disciples, if not the first disciple, to publicly declare that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. But what does he do with his very next breath? He tries to correct Jesus, tries to say, no, no. You're not going to die on a cross. He's one of only two disciples who were brave enough to follow the Lord Jesus Christ on the night of his arrest. But then what do we find him doing? We find him denying that he knows Jesus at all. That's Peter. It's Peter and, and Jacob is so similar. He's, he's the same sort of character. You can see great faith, but you can also see great fear in him. And, and let's just look at, at the promises that, that he knows. Before we see uh, the fears of his heart, let's look at the promises that he knows. Uh, he, he knows the promises of God clearly. Uh, in Genesis 28, verses 13 to 15, you, you may remember God made, made some wonderful promises uh, to Jacob. This is what God said. He said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Jacob, his family, they're perfectly safe. God has promised to keep them and to protect them. And actually, that wasn't the only time God made this sort of promise to Jacob. As, Je as God spoke to Jacob and said, now's the time for you to leave Laban and return home. Again, he promised safety. Genesis 31 verse 3. Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family. And I will be with you. These are amazing promises. God promises to be with Jacob. God promises to prosper Jacob. God promises to make a mighty nation out of Jacob. God promises that, that from Jacob's descendants will come the saviour of the world. He has the promises of God. He has experience of God's keeping power. God has literally just delivered him from the hand of Laban. God had provided for him as well throughout those 20 years he had spent with Laban. He has the promises of God. He has the experience of God's keeping power. And he has the evidence before his eyes. Just look at verse 31. So Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. Jacob is met by the angels of God. He has a host of heaven camped by him. Does it, does it perhaps put you in, the, in mind of, of that moment with, with Elisha and his servant? They find themselves surrounded by, by the Syrian army. Elisha's servant is terrified, but Elisha isn't. Elisha's calm. And, and as, they, and as they, they interact together, uh, we see that, that truly Elisha is right. There was no reason for the servant to be terrified. Why? They were surrounded by the armies of heaven. That's what the servant sees once God opens his eyes. It's in 2 Kings 6, verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. 
And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Jacob has, has a similar experience. He's guarded, protected, surrounded by the armies of heaven. He has the promises of God. He has the experience of God's keeping power in his own life. And he has all this evidence before his eyes. In his head, he must have known he was perfectly safe. He must have understood that Esau could not hurt him. But his head and his heart, they're a, they're a mile apart. Just look at, at verse 6. Then the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. So what do we read? Do we read, So Jacob trusted God? No. We read, So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He's, he's afraid. And that fear drives his actions. Instead of trusting God, he takes matters into his own hands. He, he divides his, his camp into two so that if one is killed, the others might, might get away. And, and we'll look a bit more into, into how he takes matters into his own hands in a moment or two's time. But I want us to be so clear on this point. Fear is the opposite of faith. When Jacob is afraid, it's because he's not trusting in God. When we respond in fear, it's because we're not trusting in God either. Psalm 46 verses 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. What about 2 Timothy 1 verse 7? For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear, it's not faith. Jacob is afraid. Even though he knows in his head that Esau can't hurt him, he's not trusting God as he should. Despite the promises, despite the past experience, despite the evidence before his eyes, he's still afraid. He isn't trusting God. So he takes matters into his own hands. He's a man who takes matters into his own hands. And again, this is us, isn't it? The trial comes, our immediate response is, is, what can I do? What do I need to do? And we quickly come up with a plan, perhaps, and we put it into, and we put it into action. That's what Jacob does. While surrounded by the hosts of heaven, he, he's scared of Esau and Esau's 400 men. He resorts to his old ways, verse 7. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company, which is left, will escape. Later, we, we read of more detail of, of his plans, how he, he sends his servants ahead with these gifts to seek to pacify Esau. That's verses uh, 13 to, to 20. Then in verses 22 and 24, we have him ordering his family. He's taking matters into his own hands. He's, he's trying to find his own solution to the problem. He's thinking, if I can just pacify Esau, if I can just, if I can just uh, protect at least half of what I've got. <coughs> Jacob is like us, I would suggest, because we're just like this. We struggle to trust God. Just like he's a man who often takes matters into his own hands, sometimes we do the same. And encouraging as it is to, to see him like this, to remember that he is a man who, who Hebrews 11 tells us is a, is a man of great faith. I think it's also helpful to, to have some better examples tonight as well encouraging as it is to see that, that God was still at work in his life, bringing him to that stronger faith. Let's just remind ourselves that there are other uh, better examples, perhaps, that, that show us that, that our response doesn't need to be like this. So I want to, to just briefly look at some better examples of trust. Think of Daniel's three friends. Daniel's three friends. Here they are, that they're faced with the, with the fiery furnace, they won't bow down to the statue that Nebuchadnezzar has built as the, as the music is played. And so Nebuchadnezzar threatens them with the, with the fiery furnace. 
I'm going to burn you to death, he says, if you don't bow down. What's their response? Well, we read of it in Daniel 3, 16 to 18. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Look at their faith. No fear, faith. They are trusting that God will deliver him, will deliver them from the furnace, but they are also accepting that if God doesn't, that's his will. No fear. Their, their faith has, has driven it out. <coughs> Consider the Lord Jesus Christ. There's actually no better example in scripture of a, of a faithful man than the Lord Jesus Christ. There he is on, on the night of his arrest. He's, he's faced with this horrific death of the cross. He's He's feeling the burden of our sin being laid upon his shoulders. Surely things that, that repulsed him, that revolted him as man and as God. But what is he praying? What is he praying? Luke 22, 42. Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. He's expressing his distress, his anguish, his repulsion at, at what's laying ahead. But then what does he say? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. A better example of, of a faithful man could we have? One who will trust rather than fear. Well, I need to move on. We've seen that the, the first response we have, we must have, is to trust in God. But we've seen how Jacob struggled in that one. Secondly, I want us to think about the response of prayer. The response of prayer. Look at verse 9. Then Jacob said, and this is a prayer, O God, my father, sorry, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal with you. So this prayer goes on and we need to look at it. Jacob is praying and it's a really remarkable prayer. It's actually a fantastic example of how to pray in a time of trial. And again, this is, this is us, isn't it? In one hand, we are taking matters into our own hands. We're, we're trying to do it our own way. We're trying to deal with it in our own strength. We're perhaps acting in fear. But also, we're praying to God for deliverance from the trial. So let's consider uh, Jacob's prayer. And I want you to notice that when he prays, he, he prays on the grounds of an established relationship. He prays on the grounds of an established relationship, verse 9. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, he has a relationship with God. This is the God of his grandfather. This is the God of his father. This is the God who speaks to him. His prayer is on the basis of his relationship with God. Isn't that how the Lord Jesus Christ teaches us to pray? Isn't, what he, isn't this what he said to his disciples? When you pray, pray, our Father. Our Father. We pray to God, we come into his presence on the grounds of an established relationship that we have with him. We are like children coming to our parents with our need. You know, many of us here are parents and we know, don't we, that if our child comes to us because they're hungry and they're wanting something to eat, whilst at certain times we might say, no, wait, your dinner's nearly ready. We are always going to provide them with the food that they need if we possibly can. When we come to God in prayer, we come with the same confidence that our children come to us asking for something to eat when they're hungry. Because we come on the basis of an established relationship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our father. And that's the only way to pray. If we don't have that relationship, <coughs> we can't expect God to hear or answer our prayers. Notice also that he appeals to God's promises. At verse 9 again. The Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well 
with you. Yeah, this is how we pray. It's what God wants from us. God wants us to come to him in prayer and to, and to claim the promises that he's made to us. He wants us coming to him, clinging to those promises that, that he's given to us. Perhaps sometimes in our trials, we're, we're quick to pray for, for what we want to happen, for how we expect God to, to deal with that situation for us. This is where we need to start. We need to start with the promises that he has made, the things he has said he will do for us. Notice also that Jacob has a, has a keen sense of his own unworthiness, verse 10. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Again, a fundamental basic of prayer. Seeing the huge gulf between us and, and God. Seeing his holiness, being aware of our sinfulness. Seeing his worthiness and our unworthiness. Reflecting on just how good he is to us. Maybe sometimes I wonder if we, if we come to prayer thinking just a little bit too much of ourselves. Or maybe just a, a little bit deserving. Maybe that's sometimes why our, our prayers are not answered as we would hope. Because we're not coming with a sense, a keen sense of our unworthiness and his worthiness. It's only, it's only after this that, that Jacob really brings his request to God. And even then that the request is, is still based not simply on what he wants, but on what God has said to him. Look at verse 11. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well. And make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Here he brings his request to God. And he admits his fear and his struggle to, to trust in God. This is, this is how to pray. Well, we, we don't rush into the presence of God with a, a big shopping list of, of our demands. We give thoughts to all of these matters as, as they concern Jacob. We come based on our relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We come claiming the promises that he's made to us, clinging to them. We come acknowledging our unworthiness and, and his goodness. Then, then we make our requests uh, based on, on his promises. And if we're struggling with, with that aspect of trust, when the fear is there, we shouldn't be trying to hide that from God. We should be telling him about it. We should be talking to him about it, asking him to help us to trust. We haven't spent long on, on Jacob's prayer, but actually it is, a, it is a remarkable prayer. It's a great prayer of, of real faith. And as such, it, it creates a dilemma, a conundrum for us this evening. <coughs> So on the one hand, we, we see Jacob filled with fear. We see Jacob not trusting God as he should. But yet at the same time, we see Jacob praying this, this tremendous prayer of, of great faith. And, and if these were two separate trials, if we were looking at two separate situations in the life of Jacob, we might perhaps find that easier uh, to get our heads around it and to explain. Because we can often see how, well, perhaps it's easy for Jacob to trust God in this one, but not in this one. That's not the case. There's just one trial here. Esau and his 400 men. And, and Jacob is, is praying to God and he's praying a great prayer, prayer of faith. But he's also filled with fear and he's not acting in trust. All in regards to this same trial. And so this brings me to my third and, and final point this evening. I want us to think about our mixed response to trials. Our mixed response to trials. As we look at Jacob's mixed response, I want us to, to be honest with ourselves and to think about our mixed response. How does this kind of faith coexist with this lack of faith at the same time? How, how do we explain it? 
that Jacob can be filled with fear, but also pray in this great prayer of faith. Well, we'll be able to explain it in the case of Jacob when we're able to explain it in our own lives as well. Because this, this is how we are all too often. We all respond to trials in, in different ways, but sometimes this is our response. Oh, we'd, we'd love to be like Daniel's three friends when every trial came and, and face it with the faith that they faced it with. We'd, we'd love it if, if we could demonstrate the same complete trust in God that we see in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're not always like that. The truth is so many of our responses to God are mixed. We have many mixed responses. How often perhaps do you, do, do you sit in the church uh, service and you resolve as the sermon's been preached that, that this week I'm going to live better for the Lord Jesus Christ. But almost as soon as we're up out of our seats and out of the door, we find ourselves slipping back into our old habits. How often have you prayed for, for a closer walk with God, but then you seem to leave that prayer completely unchanged? How often do you bring your trials and your concerns to God in prayer, but instead of then leaving them with him and, and trusting him, you pick them up and you take them away again, and you then respond to them in your own strength? How often is our fear greater than our faith? How often are our actions actually out of line with our prayers? We have many mixed responses. And the truth is, this is part of the war between the flesh and the spirit that goes on within us. This is part of the war between the flesh and the spirit. This is our struggle to completely trust in God, to entirely rely on on him. I do think it's incredibly comforting to know that we're not alone in that. And it becomes even more comforting, doesn't it, when we do see Jacob lifted up in, in Hebrews 11 as, as one of these examples of faith to us. Clearly, God isn't actually finished with Jacob yet. And the truth is, God isn't finished with you or with me either. And many of the Esau's that, that will come galloping towards us over, over the horizon of life, they're actually sent by God to, to wean us off this sense of self-dependence, to, to, to cause us to lean on him and, and trust him more and more, so that in our lives, faith does replace fear. So what... So what is it that, that we can take away this evening? Well, in Jacob's example, as well as learning those two key points, that we have to trust God and that we have to pray to God. Those two vital aspects of our response to the things this life throws our way. But we also get to learn this, this vitally important lesson. We get to recognise that little bit of Jacob, which is perhaps in, in all of us. We get to identify this dilemma in our response to our situations. And we're reminded that God isn't finished with us yet. We're actually all still works of grace in progress. It's comforting and it's encouraging. But I hope also it's challenging. How do we become less like Jacob? How do we become more like Daniel's three friends? How do we become more like the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we look to God. We begin by putting our trust in him to finish this work that he has begun. And he will. Philippians 1 verse 6, we have this, this wonderful promise, this, this assurance that Paul shares, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Everything God starts, he finishes. On the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he stands again upon this earth in, in all of his glory, we are going to be made complete. We are going to be made like he is. And then, and then there will be no fear. There will be 
only faith. May God help us then to to learn from Jacob this evening, to learn to trust God, to learn to pray to God, and to learn to recognise when we're struggling in those things, so that we can bring them to him in prayer and ask him to help us with our fears, just as Jacob asked God to help him with his fear as he prayed to God. Amen.